Today I have a very special guest. She's a polymer clay artist and she creates amazing pieces. We have quite a few to show here today. And I want to welcome Melissa Terlizzi. Welcome, Melissa. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. That's cool. Melissa, where are you from? Um, I live in Virginia, um, but I was born in Massachusetts, and I think my parents were sort of restless because we lived in Kentucky and Tennessee and Florida. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, but I spent most time in Florida, I would say. Uh huh. And when did you get started doing art? I used to draw a lot as a little kid. So when I was little, I was going to be an artist, but then, um, you know, life kind of got in the way. I didn't get started with polymer clay until about, um, I'm going to say about seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been creative. I like to knit. I used to sew. Um, you know, I tried my hand at oil painting for a little bit. So, but polymer clay is, is definitely the one that became an obsession. So. And, and what do you think attracted you to the polymer clay? You know, initially, I'm not sure. I, I had briefly an Etsy shop. I would make, you know, knitted things. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what could I do to set my, you know, hat and scarf apart from everybody else's that were on Etsy? And so I started making, um, like, little square brooches that would match the, the, um, the scarf or buttons or whatever out of the clay. And I just became so fascinated with it that I pushed the knitting aside and... Um, basically started doing the, the clay full time. Do you still knit at all? I do. I do. Um, I, I made this. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but not as much. Not mm -hmm. definitely not as much. Okay. Clay, clay kind of takes over your life, I think, once you... <laughs> and when you start, are you self-taught or did you take some courses? How did it, you really I, got started with polymer clay? I've been really lucky. I've, I've taken... Um, two big workshops but i went overseas for them i wanted i wanted the travel out of it so i i went to the uh gallery Freisleben in in germany and took a workshop there with uh, doreen castle mm -hmm. and then um i also went to england a couple years ago for polymania mm. and uh met donna cato and uh claire wallace so that was that was a really neat experience. So. That's cool. Yeah, but other than that, I I've bought you know every polymer clay book I could get my hands on, and I would you know read up on those. Uh huh. So. That's so cool. <laughs> we have some of your pieces to show, and I would like you to comment on them. You know what was the, especially what was the inspiration behind that? Okay. 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 Just a second. That we'll show the first one. <laughs> this one okay those yeah those were little uh, I forgot I sent you this one <laughs> those were little um, like like gift bag charms is, is what I thought initially they could be used for they had a little hole at the top and you can hang them from a ribbon um, I don't make a lot of multiples of things and um, so this was this was my effort at trying to make you know multiples and so I made the butterfly wing thing. I'm sorry if that's over. I think there is a, a do you have a necklace with you or something or is it on my end do I have what I'm sorry oh, I, I saw the, the noise but I think now it's good okay yeah okay. now it sounds good um, but yeah I made the uh, the the wing cane for it and you know uh, took leaves from the yard and pressed the the leaves into the clay to to make the texture on the background there. Mm -hmm. But I just really like the colors, the sort of earthy kind of dark moodiness of those, of those I think it's a Saturn moth or something, I can't remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. This piece, this was a piece, I think I called it Wild Things and um, I created it, it was for a silent auction uh, for Alzheimer's, to raise money for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I chose it to send to you because it has a lot of different things that that I really like to make. I love toads. They're like my favorite favorite thing. You know, they are one of my favorite too. <laughs> I know. And this one, I just really, I mean, it's probably hard to see in the photo because there's, there's so much. It's not really zoomed in enough, but um, he has really expressive eyes and, mm -hmm. and I liked that about him. And also, 
uh, tree bark. I really like trying to make realistic looking tree bark and mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty good example of that. It's a great example, <laughs> very <laughs> cute. This piece is called Waterworks and it's actually hanging right now in a show called Flow, which is uh, a Liberty Town Arts Workshop here in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And uh, so the subject of anything in the show had to do with water or its uses. And so I had the idea of doing uh, pipes. Mm -hmm. And at the top, you can't, can't, again, you can't really see it too well, but there's a, the spigot at the top has resin water pouring from it. And then at the bottom, the little sink also has resin, you know, pouring out of the <laughs> faucet. That's a very cool piece. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned, uh, you showed the first piece, for example, that you made with canes. So did you start with canes or you went into sculpting first? What was the process? Well, like I said, the first thing I did were, were these little brooches. So the very first piece I did was kind of a tree branch and it had like cherry blossoms on it and... Um, you know, it's just really, really simple. Uh, and I think in the background I had pressed like Japanese coins into the, the clay uh, to give it some texture. So it wasn't until, you know, I, I was doing those things with clay and then I bought a book. There's Donna Cato had a book, um, The Art of, is it, is it Mia, I'm going to mispronounce it, Mila Fiori, Fiori? Oh, Mila yeah. Fiori, yes, Fiori yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. And, um, I bought that book and like did every single cane that she demonstrated in that book. So um, I think I, I started without doing canes and then I really got into canes and then I kind of drifted away from canes. So it's, it's all an evolution. I still use a lot of canes, you know, like in those butterfly wings, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not real precise with it. So I'll do a stripe cane or... Um, a bullseye cane or, or a simple thing like that. I don't do these like amazing canes that you see some polymer artists can do. They're really intricate designs, mm -hmm. but it's fun. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, what usually inspires you before you start a creation? I don't know. I usually will have, you know, some sort of an idea will pop into my head. I, I'm very inspired by the outdoors and, um, you know, nature and animals. Um, I love to, uh, I think you'll have a picture coming up of like a, a, a turtle or a tortoise. I love looking at the patterns that they have in their shells and trying to think, okay, how would I combine clay to mimic that? Mm. I'm not real good at coming up with my own um, colors or designs. I would never, I'd make a lousy jewelry designer. <laughs> but I'm really good at mimicking something that I see. And that, to me, is the fun of it. That's the challenge, is trying to, uh, um, you know, replicate something that's out there. And a lot of the animals I choose, I'm, I'm not a, you know, sweet little fuzzy animal type of person. I love reptiles and frogs mm -hmm. and bugs and things like that. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I do connect with what you just said about mimicking things because... I think I'm the same way. Uh, it's easier for me to see something and think, how do I create that? Other than coming from an abstract idea from right. the get-go. I, th I think we just have different processes, right? To get yeah. into creation. We have some people here, uh, Jennifer, April, Maria Jose, uh, Beverly from Edmonton, Canada, Washington. <laughs> So guys, don't forget that you can ask questions and participate as much as you want. Just write down on the comments so I can ask her. Uh, or else I may run out of questions, right? So you yeah. want to participate. Yeah, Melissa, tell me do, nice. you, do you <laughs> sell your pieces? I do. I, I'm, I, I like to say that I'm probably the poster child for how not to run a business. You know, I don't have a website. I don't do Etsy. Um, I do sell work over Facebook, and I now have, I was a member of a gallery, um, but that kind of just got to be too hard for me. But I do have um, a small, like six small pieces at a gallery in Fredericksburg, Virginia, um, that I'll keep rotating out, and that, that's called Liberty Town Arts. And I, like I said, I also sell over Facebook, and then I enter as many shows as I, as I can, and the work will be for sale through the 
to the shows. Do you, do you go to art shows or do you participate in craft shows as well? Art shows. Art shows. Yeah, okay. yeah I've never done a craft show. Mm -hmm. Let's show some more pictures of your work, okay? <laughs> I have a gorgeous turtle to show. Yay! This one is really neat. This is, um, he's, it's only half of a turtle. So what you see is, that's it. He, he's flat on the back. And it was a commission piece for a, a man who lives in Tucson, Arizona. And he has like this fabulous adobe house. And mm -hmm. uh, his fireplace was, you know, all adobe. And it had these very shallow niches. And he wanted a desert tortoise to be peeking out of one of the, the niches, but it could only be, I don't remember what the dimensions were, but it could only be like maybe six inches wide. So it couldn't be a whole turtle. Mm -hmm. So he now, this guy now sits on a, uh, a shelf somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> this one, this owl was a commission for a, a woodworker, a man, an, a wood artist here in, in Fredericksburg. And his wife loves owls, so this was a commission for her birthday, and he took a fabulous branch and then, you know, created like a wooden uh, base for it, and then I made this owl, and we mounted it onto the branch for her birthday. Oh, how cool. So, but he was a really cute little owl. At this point, he's sort of like an owl sickle because he had no feet. He just had like an aluminum rod and uh, stuck, you know, <laughs> stuck through him, and, he, and I stuck him into the the ground to take his picture that's cool this uh, is th one this is amazing this piece Thank by you. the way this one uh, is meant to be a thai market the floating market in thailand and this was another piece for a show uh every year they have uh here locally they have a show called feast for the eyes and all the art has to have something to do with food and so that's why i chose this one this took forever because each like I had to do the hull of the boat and bake it and then the little planks, you know, each, each boat has different wood planks on it. So this um, piece is a hundred percent polymer clay? It, uh, no, it, it's a hundred percent polymer clay, the people and the boats and the fruit and vegetables and all of that. The, the water is resin. Okay. So I, um, uh, you know, I had to make like a form for it and poured the resin into that. And then to make it look like there were ripples, I used uh, that gel medium, I think it's called. I can't remember. I have it right. Oh, no, I don't have it behind me. Um, but yeah, it has, you, you can squeeze that out and whip that up and then it dries clear. Um, and then, of course, I dyed that there was some paint added to the resin to give it that sort of dark, murky, mm -hmm. murky look. This one's one of my favorites. This is the beekeeper's box. And there is, there's resin in that one too. I mixed uh, some gold mica powder in with the resin to give it kind of sparkle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, put all these bees and sort of stuck them in the honey. And then did the frame. Wow. And it was a new frame, but I um, have a very smart friend who, who was able to tell me how to age the wood, use steel wool and vinegar and so I made it look really old. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> how, how big is the piece? That, it's not very big at all. I think it's uh, maybe five by seven, a little frame. Beautiful. That one is not big. Melissa, many people that watch this podcast, of course, they, they consider having whatever they do as a side business or even the main business. So Maria Jose, for example, is asking, can you tell us prices of your art? So can you give an idea? Um, it, it depends. I, this is, I struggle with this. I think most artists do. I, I, you know, I struggle with underpricing. Like I, I think sometimes I really need to ask a lot more than, than what I do, but you, you know, you're kind of like, eh. <laughs> um, that piece that you, with the, um, the Thai marketplace, I, I'm going to get this wrong. I, I think that was 375 and that was probably, you know, undervalued because you figure you make every little artichoke that goes <laughs> onto that thing and, it, you know, it takes a long time. Um, but I try to think of, you know, with polymer art, the polymer clay costs next to nothing. So your, your investment is your idea, you know, the creativity, your technique and, and your time. 
And that's the big one is how, how time, you know, how much time you spend on these things. Um, so I know that's not really answering the question, but like, for example, um, a little toad would be probably 50, mm -hmm. um, you know, 45, 50, uh, a big piece, you know, anywhere from 100 to 300. That, that piece I showed at the beginning, the, um, the, the waterworks, uh -huh. the pipes, the pipes. That, yeah. That, that one is for sale for three eighty. But again, when you're when you're exhibiting at a gallery, you have to take into account the the gallery takes most most galleries take forty percent. Mm -hmm. So you know it, it breaks your heart to part with something that you've spent so much time creating, and then you know yeah. you, you, by the time you're done, you've got nothing. Yeah. True. But, but I, think, but I think part of it, too, is, is that I absolutely love what I do. And mm -hmm. if I never sold a piece, I would hang them all around my house and, you know, the walls would be completely cluttered with them. I just, you know, I, I think those of us who create this stuff, we do it because it's just sort of, it's a, it's a calling. And you just, you know, whether you sell it or not, you're going to make it. And, and you, you run out of places to put the pieces if you don't start selling I have a drawer that's full of some of cast offs. Yep. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think you, you know this person. I have a feeling. Marilyn Patricia Wright Ross. I love this piece and I get to look at it every day. Yes, she <laughs> has the time art. Well, she can tell you how much she paid for it. Oh, that piece yeah. is amazing. <laughs> yeah, because she can tell you that she, um, she lived in Thailand as a little girl, so that oh. people. That piece really uh, struck her. Talks to her. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's the other thing, the storytelling behind the, every piece, right? Not only in, the, in this case, of course, <clears throat> it triggers some memories and some emotions because she lived there. But even on the one that you show uh, with, with the, what was the one? The, the Beast, for example, the whole process, right, also tells a story. Do you refer as yourself, I know you use polymer art, but do you refer as your, uh, to yourself as a, uh, a sculptor, or how do you like it? Uh, I always just use the blanket term artist, you know, I try, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess I probably am more of a sculptor mm -hmm. than, you know, the, a lot of the things that, that I like to do now are are small, like those butterflies, for instance, small things that you can hang up. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, the, the gallery, the gallery that I belong to, Artful Dimensions Gallery, which was in, uh, is also in Fredericksburg, um, that was all 3D art. You know, that was the, the, there were no painters there. It was all, you know, sculpture. So. Okay. I like bit. to call it sculpting because I think that's what is, it is, right? in the core, but every artist we interview address themselves in a different way. But I think at the end, you're getting clay, you're turning something that doesn't have a form to a form. For well, me, it's, that's the it's interesting because it's kind of like, uh, I get a lot of my, um, I, I study a lot of photographs, you know, I try to, like if I'm going to make a, a bird or whatever, I'll try to find as many photos as I can of that animal and then look at it from every possible angle. So in a way, you're taking something that's three-dimensional, you know, the bird, and then you're looking at all these flat images of it, and then you're trying to turn it back three-dimensional again with your clay, and then, uh, and then you know, lately you're doing these flat pieces that I do. It's a now a 3D thing, but you're trying to squish it back <laughs> into yes. an almost a two, it's like a two and a half D type thing, so. We, which I have to tell you, we are going to show in a second some. Uh, that's what really attracted me to you the first time I saw. Thank you. I said, yes, it has, it still tells the story of the 2D, but it's not. And <laughs> I, I think that's fantastic. But I want to read some comments first. Iris is saying, wow, was just surfing your page and your sculpts have so much character. I love them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, Marilyn, how much research do you have to do when creating a piece? It depends on, on what it is. I, I get kind of 
drawn down the rabbit hole. You know, I, I'll look at, I love Flickr. Flickr is a great resource for photos, for nature photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I'll find, you know, I'll, for a lizard, it's like, well, how many toes does that lizard have? So then I'll Google it and I'll end up, you know, finding out that it's endangered and I'll go and I'll look there or I'll, you know, it, 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 it depends on what it is. But a lot of times I, I, um, I get sucked into the science and the, and the research part of it. And I, I don't know, I think that's really important because it, it somehow or another that then goes back into um, the, the creation. Some of that research, I think, helps fill out the personality of the, mm -hmm. of the thing you make. I, I love that process, and I think that that's quite common, I, I would say, with artists. The other day, I don't know if you are aware, we did a competition, a live competition, sculpting, and we chose uh, Aardvark, I'm, oh. and I'm probably mispronouncing the name, as the topic, and I thought, nobody's going to know what animal it is, right? <laughs> well, one of the sculptors not only knew, she knew a lot of facts about that. And I said, but have you ever seen one? And no, is that when she's thinking about a sculpture, she actually spends quite a bit on, on researching. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to show you the next piece. And one of my questions then was a question also from one of our viewers is, how long does it take you to create a piece? And I know that varies a lot, probably on the... Uh, the boat one, you took a lot more than others, but I think this would be a good one for you to, to let us know, on average. That, that one probably did not take me very long <laughs> at all. Um, because there's not a whole, I mean, it looks detailed, but there really isn't a whole lot of detail in that. It's, it's um, you know, rectangles for the buildings, and then I have these fabulous little brass rectangular cutters in different sizes to cut out windows. What, what's fun about that piece and, say, the one with the pipes is that the process, I don't, I don't even know if process is the right word, but the process sort of takes over and you're just into this little city that you're making and, you know, it has the little farms in the front and I think there's sheep down there in the, in the grass. And, and you just lose yourself so that the hours go by and, and, you know, you would say, okay, well, that didn't take me any time at all. But then again, then the day is done and it's time to make dinner, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that probably took, from start to finish, probably a couple days. Okay. Now, this one took a whole lot longer. And this one's interesting. Um, it's called Feathers and Foliage, and it now lives in Australia, I'm happy to oh, say. Oh, cool. Um, uh, I actually chronicled the creation of this on the on my Facebook page. So the, the the background I spend a long time on that. If you see the the tree trunks in the back, mm -hmm. there was a that's a Skinner blend. So the black clay you know fades to the green because uh -huh. I thought well when you're looking deep into a forest, you know it's going to be black. Yeah. Um, I spent a long time on that background, and then I ended up you know, covering most of it up. But on, on Facebook, I took pictures of all the different steps of, of that and the birds. The birds were made and baked before they were ever put on there. Same thing with the, uh, the flowers. All the different, different elements to that were, were baked separately and then sort of glued together at the end. How, how big of a piece is that? That's the largest piece I've ever made. And, I, really? and it's funny, I was, I was actually trying to rehearse in my head today what you could ask me. And I thought, I bet you'll ask me how big that is. <laughs> and I think it's, it's definitely more than a foot. So I'm thinking it was probably like a 14 inch square. Okay. Yeah. This piece I actually have right behind me. Oh, um, let's see that. Yeah. Hang on. All right. I'm going to try not to rip my earbuds out. <laughs> <sighs> Give me just a second so we can put the image on you. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. It's, I got it. I don't know. I can't really see how much you can see. Let's see. Yeah, her room. <laughs> there we there go. There we go. Yay. Well, there. But, yeah, so this is a six by six inch piece. And I don't know if you can see there's little bits that stick up. Uh -huh. I wanted to make water splashes. So that's, um, I have really thin, like, beading wire, and I drizzled hot glue down the wire and then let it dry kind of coming off the edge and then 
stuck the wires in the resin as it was curing. So, so there is no res. Uh, so you have a, a layer of resin there, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I made, I, I did a, um, like a paper cutout of the same, same dimensions. And then I arranged all the fish on the paper cutout uh, and baked it on that. Oh. And then after I did that, I, you know, I, I always paint over top of the clay. I don't like just plain naked clay. So like for this, I'm try, again, I'm trying to see the camera here. I don't know, where's my finger? Sorry, see how there's a uh, mm -hmm. the white fish there. I went over it with black, you know, because it brings out all the the little ridges and. Do you use acrylic to paint, or what do yes. you use? Yes, yeah, okay. I use acrylic paint. But yeah, so I I painted all the fish and then I laid them in here, and then poured the resin over top. Okay. And then as the resin was drying, I you know had like a spoon and I was whipping up the the peaks of it to make it look like the water was real turbulent. That's so cool. Well, since we are looking in your background, talk to us about the other pieces that you have there. Well, I, you can see on the wall, I have like a giant frog picture. <laughs> That's a, a photograph I took of a piece I made, and I love the photograph so much that I thought for my studio it would be kind of fun to have one of those big canvas uh, prints of it. And then, or again, I'll reach. Hang on. <laughs> I, have, I have a little toad here. So you oh, can yes, I've much. seen the pictures of this guy. And then you, you, it's, a, it's a bit of a pun, you know, cane toads, <laughs> they're the ones that, you know, hopping around Hawaii, the horrible, the big giant cane toads. Mm -hmm. So this is a polymer clay cane toad because I put like little uh, cane slices uh -huh. all over the back of it. But yeah, so he's, he's cute. And they've, these guys have evolved. This guy actually is shaped like a frog. I have other ones that, like this one, I have frogs everywhere, sorry. But here's another one that's like more flat. He's like more upright. Uh -huh. That's cute. But anyway. And then I have this other piece. Hang on, I'll grab it. That, let's see if you can see this one. So this is, <laughs> I had such a hard time arranging it. Okay, so this is more, more tree bark, which I love to do. And I have a luna moth. And it just has a little bit of everything. It has violets and those uh, Johnny in the pulpit, I think they're called. I don't know if you can see that. And um, mushrooms. And I would go out in the woods. These are really good to make during the, the spring and summer when you have green leaves. Because then, you know, you can use the, the leaves to press into the clay. Oh, and then, okay, you know. to, get, to give the texture. Yeah, exactly. And I actually, what I do is um, I get two leaves that are roughly this, you know, as close to the same exact size and shape as I can. And then I sandwich the clay between them so that when I curl the leaves up, it has the veins on the front and the back, you know. That's so cool. Um, but yeah, I really love this piece. So they, these are ones that I couldn't let go of. So I have them in my house. <laughs> and the, the background is a piece of wood? Uh, on this yeah. is actually a canvas. A canvas, okay. Yeah, so yeah, a regular canvas. Alicia Lehman is saying, love the macaw piece. I like oh. that one. Too. I like all of them. Alisa <laughs> uh, is also asking, how are the, the pieces attached? I use, I like to use, well, it depends on if it's a really big, if it's just a little piece, I'll use um, like that E6000 glue, or I even have, um, I have a bottle of the Weld, Weld Bond that I'll use for stuff. Um, if it's a big piece, like the case in point, that Thai marketplace, that was really heavy. Yeah. Um, I have to use a two-part epoxy glue um, that, you, you know, you have to mix the two parts together and then they set and they, they, they don't let go. Okay. So it's, and the polymer clay, do you have one that you like the most or you use most of the time or not? I almost always use uh, Primo. I really like Primo. Okay. It seems to be the right... Um, the right balance of, of hardness and, you know, e ease of use. Like I, I have a bunch of Kato clay as well, which is great for jewelry because it's um, so strong, but um, I, I don't care. That's terrible. I don't care for the smell of it when it's <laughs> cooking, but also it's just really hard to get it conditioned. But yes. yeah, Primo is my go-to. 
But you mentioned that you paint the, uh, the clay later. So do you work with basically one color, or do you like to play the, with the colors they come into? I, are you, oh, you mean of the clay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I love the colored clay. Okay. And in fact, um, paint, I, you know, I don't, paint is one of those sort of controversial things with polymer clay, because, and I used to feel that way too, is that if you painted your clay, you were cheating somehow. Um, but I use paint to just sort of accent what is already there with the, with the clay. So if I'm making an orange fish, I'll put red, red paint on it and then wipe most of it off. I just want, I, I spend a lot of time with texture. Mm -hmm. And if you don't add paint, the textures really don't show up. And I think, too, with, with I, I hate the, the plasticky um, oh, yes. look to polymer clay. And I think if you add... If you if you say wash wash your clay with uh, a little bit of brown or black or whatever get you know get it in the grooves and then uh, wipe it off sand it off and then dry brush either you know like a a white or a yellow or something I just think it gives it a whole lot more dimension looks more yes. interesting and, and shadows and highlights as well yeah, right exactly. that they bring and, I, and and for the future that's something I think that I'd really like to be better educated about I would like to take painting and you know and and learn more about that you know that that's not only a challenge and a, a myth in polymer clay it, for example with wood carving that's always the issue people think you shouldn't paint but if you do you was the wash and and mm -hmm. basically what you just said to not allow it to look plasticky because it, it does too with wood if you're not careful uh Iris is asking, well, you just answered that. Uh, what glue do you use? So the 36,000 6, and the other one, right? Yeah, I have right now, I have a, it's, um, I've had really good luck with it. It's, you can buy it at Walmart and everywhere. It's, it's uh, Gorilla Glue, but it's a two-part epoxy. It dries clear and it sets in like five minutes. But so far it's held. I haven't had anybody tell me that something has fallen off the wall, so. So do, do you see yourself as a perfect, perfectionist when it comes to, to the sculpting or not? Ah, perfectionist. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty detail-oriented. Okay. Uh, and, and I can be, like so many people, I'm probably my, my worst critic. But I've learned, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned from doing those wall pieces that you have to sort of pick and choose what you want to add the most detail to. So um, if you're doing the parrots, parrots hanging in a forest or something, you're not going to see the tree bark on a tree that's, you know, 100 yards in the distance. So, you know, stick to doing the details in the feathers on the bird or, you know, or mm -hmm. the eyeballs of the frog or whatever it is that you're <laughs> making. That's cool. Um, I, I just escaped me. I had a question for you. No, you went away. No problem. Let's see that <laughs> chameleon that you made. <laughs> this is a, a Jackson's chameleon, or it's meant to look like a Jackson's chameleon. This is the, the only one like that I've made. I think I've done a lot of chameleons, but I always do the ones that have the, the, like the head crest, the, the tall head crest, and not the ones with the horns. Um, what you can't see is that the moth has like a really alarmed look on his face. <laughs> so, She's about a, to be cool eaten. One. This one was another one I did. Um, again, there's a lot of these are older pieces, but I just thought they were really good examples. Mm -hmm. um, this was a piece I made specifically for a river festival. We had um, the, the gallery Artful Dimensions had a booth at, you know, in the art section of this river festival and so I wanted to do something you know that kind of smacked of the river and um, I did the background first which was like a Skinner blend and it came out really aqua like very it, it just screamed like Florida Beach you know all it needed was Jimmy Buffett or something on it it was <laughs> it was uh, very bright and so I took brown paint and just went over the whole thing and really toned it down. And that's why I love it because I think it just has sort of a painterly look about it. It's mm -hmm. real, the colors are real subdued and, and it's also the gray and the yellow, which are colors that I don't really use a whole lot. So, well, gray maybe I do, but not the yellow. So I just really liked it. And another 
pro another thing that was funny that shows you the evolution uh, was the the background ended like right kind of at the bird's kneecaps if you can mm. if you can imagine and the problem was I needed something to do I needed a place for it to land and so I kept building on to the bottom of it so the you know, I added the bank there and then the plants because I think I don't I can't I can't really see it, but I, I don't even think I put feet on it or maybe I only put one foot on it. Uh huh. I was trying to avoid feet. Oh, yeah, I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's awesome. Uh, he was another one that was in a show and a friend of mine bought him and he lives at her house now. <laughs> but he was cool because the. Uh, the mouth, when I put him in the oven, I, I don't know that I supported his head, you know, well or whatever, but his mouth kind of dropped open as he was baking. And it's oh. so serendipitous because he has like this perfect little grin on his face. Mm -hmm. So I really, I love how that one turned out. And I also, you know, going back to talking about canes and patterns, I, I really like the the shell pattern on his. Yeah, so, so those... Shells on the top, they, they are a cane, correct? Yes. Okay. The same with the butterfly. The butterfly was a cane. And the scales too? I'm sorry? The scales on the leg, are they also? Yeah, okay. yeah they were like little bullseye canes uh, that I cut into scales. These are our bats. I, I gave you this example because these are something I make repeatedly. Every fall, I make bats, and they sell instantly. And I think... I love them because I have actually have a couple of them hanging around my house right now, but they have, rather than feet, they just have wires sticking out so that you can wrap them around and they hang upside down from things. So they are actually individual pieces. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Cool. And I have them hanging on a fence, fence there, but, um, but yeah, this year was the, or this past fall was the first time I've done them with their wings open. And I tried to be like a little bit more correct with their anatomy, but mm -hmm. I'm sure a bat expert would find like all kinds of problems with them because I wanted to make their faces cute. Uh -huh. But um, I love Halloween and I love the fall. And I thought, you know, rather than a cartoony sort of Scooby-Doo type bat, I wanted to make something that was a little bit more realistic, but yet still not Still so have the whimsical yeah. part. <laughs> exactly. So you said that bats sell well, specifically to the Halloween or as a whole? any time of the year uh, uh, oh you mean in the fall or like yeah, they, I the only bats. make them in, I only make them in the fall but okay. um, but yeah I sold them all this this past year over Facebook just mm -hmm. said hey I have bats for sale you know message me if you want one and and then they're gone but I had I made them and originally I had a solo show and gosh I'm not even it was October which is like my favorite month of the whole year and um, I, I think it was like two, must have been three years ago now that I had this show. But anyway, I made the bats for that and sold a whole bunch of them there at that show. So. That's so cool. That's very cool. Maria Jose is saying, uh, you should definitely visit Ecuador. She's there and your oh. pieces would be a success, I bet. I, I went to Costa Rica this past summer. Oh, and, really? Yeah, just loved it. Fell in love with the sloths and yeah. we had... Uh, with the basilisk lizards, I think, or big, big old lizards hanging out by the swimming pool. It was amazing. Amazing. Wow, that's so fantastic. count me in. I'm there. <laughs> yeah, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe she wants to put a workshop together yeah. there. Uh, Iris is asking, did you uh, go over favorite tools that you use? So tell us a little bit your sculpting process. Do you use the fingers a lot? Do you have special tools that you like? I have, let's see, I, I do use my fingers a lot. I have... Um, I have two clay machines. I have just the regular cheapo pasta machine that you buy at the craft store. And then I have the, the fancy dream machine. And I really, I only use the dream machine for big things because it's got such nice wide rollers that, okay. you know, you can, you can, and it's good for conditioning clay. Um, I also love these things. I have, I have these in different, let's see, where's the camera again? I have one of, the, I have, this is my favorite one. I don't the know what size it is. Yeah, the, the, it's got the nice mm -hmm. squishy tip. I have this, and that inspired me to buy, like, them in every, like, yes. size <laughs> that comes in. And, oh, you would like my, you would like my little thing that I keep my oh. tools in, my little frog cup. Um, 
I also have the ball tools, you know, with the ball. Mm -hmm. The that stylus are, ball. Really good, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then I love the Kemper. I use circle cutters for oh, every all the time. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. Uh -huh. But it's just the same stuff that everybody else everybody <laughs> uses. Yeah, so. you, but you, you usually use a lot of them in each creation or because a lot of us, we have all those tools, but then when it comes time, we use one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's probably true. I would say, well, I always use, um, you know, like, like every other polymer artist out there, I have my, my trusty tissue blade that's all rested. Yeah. Um, I have a needle tool. And these, these things keep, you know, the, the Sculpey. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, like, murder somebody in my yeah, house, no. this, is where, <laughs> this is where you come. But um, I keep those tools out all the time. I would say this thing is the thing I use, you know, the more than brush. anything. Yeah. Um, but I also have a lot of texture things, you know, like the bag that your potatoes come in, you know, that I cut out. Anytime I can find a cool texture, I'll, I'll um, you know, save it. My husband, anytime there's like cool packing material that comes in boxes, he saves, that. He saves it for me. And I have a box that's all textures. Because mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know, I think you feel really excited when you find something for free and it mm -hmm. turns out to be really good. Um, I have, I have like, you know, sewing pins that I, I use to make circles oh, and things. And, that's cool. And, and how, how prolific are you? How often do you create? Are you creating all the time? Oh, oh yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. I ha I'm kind of an obsessive person. Like I'll have, I'll have passions that like right now I'm kind of on a knitting spurt. So I've already <laughs> knitted two things this winter. Um, I also recently took up bread baking. So I've now decided like I don't, I don't buy bread anymore. So I'm making like four loaves of bread a week. Mm. And, um, but clay, I, I, I was almost every day I've got to do something, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I don't feel like I've accomplished anything if I don't get my hands in the clay sometimes. What, uh, how are you with style? So I noticed on, on Facebook, for example, that you, you've been creating a lot of this, let's call it 2D, 3D dimensional uh, wall pieces. Do you, I, when you were creating, do you move away from one type of creation to another, or do you tend to stick for a long time? What's your process? Do you mean like, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you for mean example, like do right I have now, multiple projects going at one time, or just, is that what you Well, that, that's a good one too. Do you have multiple <laughs> projects at the same time? Um, at the moment, no. Although I do have one piece that I haven't finished that has collecting dust over here in the corner. But most of the time, I'm pretty focused. I will start one thing and finish it. And finish that. Yeah, I'm pretty that's good it. about that. That, that's a unique trait for an artist because most of the time what I hear is, yeah, I have five or six things yeah, going I on at the same time. Yeah, I not to do that because it kind of drives me crazy to see them because it's like just this niggling worry off to the side, that, especially if it's a commission or something. I, uh -huh. That's why I don't like to do a lot of commissions because I'm not very good at getting stuff done. Okay, that's a good <laughs> point. What, what don't you like about commissions? Because you mentioned you you took some, right? You, yeah. Some of the pieces were commissioned. You know, I I don't honestly know. I think maybe I mean because people are wonderful and they they've some of the wonder most like unique cool ideas mm -hmm. have been because of commissions. So I don't want to sound like I'm mm -hmm. I'm ungrateful for that. Like you know turtles and stuff. I love doing that. I think sometimes I just it it gets a little uh, deadlines. You know deadlines are kind of frightening if somebody wants something for a birthday and you feel all this pressure or if it's something you don't really feel like making because I have I definitely have to be in a mood to do a certain thing I can't just say today I'm going to make butterflies and be happy about it in fact that is a I had a commission years ago to make like 25 butterflies for somebody and it just oh my god it was like root canal surgery having to do, do <laughs> these butterflies but but yeah, I, I, um, I, I would say it's probably just the pressure, the pressure of, uh, and the insecurity of not knowing 
am, is this going to be what they want? They you want, know, yeah. Is it going to be, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's <laughs> the, the biggest question, actually, right? Because when you're creating whatever you want, uh, you don't have that accountability, right? Nobody has to like. But when it's a commission, on the other hand, they have to like. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Su Susie Brewer is saying, I can relate about the commissions. Me too. You know, I'm, all, I'm always okay we get a commission. But the moment I get it, I go, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, somebody will say, you know, I want you to make this. And you're like, yeah, that's a great idea. I can't wait. And then when it's time to sit down, you're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd rather make a frog. <laughs> I'll just make a frog. Do but, you have any any plans for the near future related to your art? Um, not specifically. No, no. I, you know, I just sort of float around. I, I like I said before, I, I, I'm not a very good business person, and I don't have a big master plan. I just sort of float from one opportunity to the next. Like, for instance, you know, I am doing this. I never thought this opportunity would, <laughs> would happen. But um, I, I do a monthly column now at um, Polymer, Polymer Universe, Polymer Clay Universe. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know exactly what it is. And um, so I'll do a, a little monthly column and tutorial for that. Um, you know, like I said, it's a new venture for me to have these few pieces at the gallery called Liberty Town. So I have to keep giving them some, some new work. Um, there's another deadline at the end of this month for, for art, um, for a show. So I have to get, get that finished to get photos submitted for that to see if I can get a piece into that show. Um, that's a show that's every year called Dimensional Expression. So it's all 3D art. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try to enter that. And uh, oh, and actually, I do have another project that I want to do. Um, I had it's related to some things that I had put on Facebook um, that that you use the little rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. I did. Um, uh, lady, lady. Uh, liked the rhinoceros and she said that, you know, you should do a bongo, a bongo antelope. And it turns out that she works with bongo antelopes and oh. there's, and her company um, is out of Florida and they help, and it's terrible, I, I should have all this written down so I can share it with you, but, but they, um, they create breeding programs for endangered animals. And so she was talking to me a little bit about the animals that they're trying to help. And um, so I got to thinking that I'd like to do little squares like little two inch squares with an endangered animal like mm. a critically endangered animal maybe something that a frog that's nearing extinction that most of us have never heard of or you know i feel like that would be something that i would enjoy educationally and and i could take all of those little animals mm -hmm. and you know again not spend a whole lot of time on each one maybe you know a few hours here and there and then mount them all together on like a massive canvas of some sort and then try to figure out, okay, what could I do with this piece of artwork? Because then, then maybe it would, you know, I could use it somehow to raise awareness or yes. raise money or, you know, so anyway, so that's, that's something I have kind of in my head right now. And she gave me the name of some websites that I can, can look at to get more information and to find out, you know, what animals need her help. So. That's fantastic. That's a great okay. idea. I've seen once in a total different medium. Um, it is rug hooking, of all things. The artist created a panel of animals in extension, only showing one eye of each animal. So oh. every square, for example, she used a lot of reptiles, uh, would be the eye of a snake. Mm -hmm. And then another one. And, and it was a gorgeous work, too. And I think I'm all for creating awareness for animals because, you know, we, we are living in a moment where we are very detached from them. Unless you go to the zoo, you usually live in places where you don't have access to animals. And if we don't have access to them, we stop caring about them. So anything that brings that is important. That's right. I mean, they say that, the, that most people, the only wildlife they see, you know, on a daily basis would be birds, you yeah. know. Even if they then, pay attention to them. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't even see many birds anymore. So. Yes, yeah, it is, it is important to create awareness. So I'm all for your project. <laughs> Alisa is saying, is there any chance we could get 
you to teach a class to, for our guild in Chicago? I'm sorry, you were breaking up a little bit okay, there. Okay, Alisa Lehman is saying, is there any chance we could get you to teach a class for our guild in Chicago? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, um, just just contact me through Facebook probably would be the easiest way, and, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. I have not done any traveling for teaching. I mean, I have taught. Um, <laughs> But I haven't, I haven't done anything like that. But that's definitely something that I have in mind for, for my long-term down the road future. I mean, my, it's certainly my husband's plan. He, he's going to retire and uh, carry my bags around the world. Well, that's perfect. <laughs> well, we, he's leaving my Sherpa I'll be, uh, while I go teach places. So, yeah, I would definitely be interested in that. That's fantastic. I just need help. I'm not, you know, you see so many of these artists that have these wonderful classes that have you know, on, on caning or, you know, jewelry design or whatever. And, and that's not me. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like that's my skill set. So I would need help with coming up with a topic. You know, what would people want to learn? What, you know, what would they want to do? Well, I, I, I think you already have that portfolio. Um, for me, really, when I first saw your pieces, the, this 2D, 3D caught my attention right away. And okay. I think it's a fantastic project. But your wall pieces uh, with the, the birds there, I, I don't know anybody that wouldn't like to learn that. Um, where is, oh, yes, where are you located? I'm in uh, Virginia, Stafford, Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. so it's easy yeah. to travel. No, no big deal. Yeah, not, not too far from DC. So, so you, you mentioned you don't have a website. So tell us how people can get in touch with you. Really, right now it's it's Facebook. That that's about it. I I don't do Instagram. I you know I'm just I live in a I live in a cave. <laughs> I'm just I'm just not into all of that. But uh -huh. yeah, I have I have Facebook, and I'm really active on Facebook. So you can always reach me there, and I check it several times a day. So. And you have your personal profile. You also have a page, correct? I have it. Yeah, I do very little on my personal profile. So if people often will will friend or crest that friend request me on Facebook and I don't respond because it's, you know, it's kind of like pictures of my kids with their report cards kind of thing. And I, I, um, I spend a whole lot more time and attention on the, the clay page. So mm -hmm. what's the name of the page? Um, it would be www.facebook.com uh, backslash M L Terlizzi. So T E R L I Z Z I dot art, A R T. And they Fantastic. can find me there. <laughs> That's the best. That's great. One last question for you What keeps your creativity in focus? Ooh, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe like I said before, I do, I do lots of different things. Like sometimes you just need to put the clay aside and, and take a break and go bake a loaf of bread or, you know, watch TV or something. I, I just recently had knee surgery, so I'm not doing a whole lot of exercise right now, but I was a very avid runner. So, you know, if you have a, a problem with your clay, you know, with how, how something's going to work out, nothing, nothing solves it faster than going out for a run and, and you just, the engineering of it all will, will come into focus. Um, but I also have, I have a uh, a son in college, but I have three kids still at home, and I think nothing keeps you grounded quite like kids. <laughs> so, and and the husband. So yeah, I, I definitely keep very busy. Quite busy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry if I don't pronounce your name right. Crit Critica Partman. Uh, I think you are a wonderful teacher, and I love your tutorials. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Helen Dorn is saying. I need, I need to change my glasses, that's for sure. <laughs> like I love me. your clay work. <laughs> I try to see it. Oh, I know. Nothing's oh. ever the right distance. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, first of all, thank you guys for participating. You really make a difference here, participating with the artists. I know it's always a great energy for all of us to see that what we create is important, it matters, and people enjoy. And every time you leave a comment, that's what you're telling the artists. So thank you very much. And Melissa, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. I, I really like your work. I told you that before. And I know a lot of people now will be able to share this video and spread the word about what you do even more. So keep creating because now you. you have a legion of fans here. <laughs> Yay, thank you very much. Again, guys, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget that every Tuesday we have a new artist where we talk about the life, the business, and of course, the art that they create. Next week, we have Jack Hoke with us. He does Silver's Meeting from scratch, which is really unique, and he does reverse intaglio. So he creates uh, amazing figures in crystals and glass. You don't want to miss him. He's really cool, too. Every, every week, we have a cool artist here. So thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to share this. This is really important for us. And I'll see you back here next Tuesday.